How about your graph notice? <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I uh, I received that. Well, I don't remember the month, but it was well in advance of induction. And uh, I was happy to get it because I wanted to join and my mother didn't want me to join. So she didn't have any say so. But once I got a draft notice, it was uh, all, all go from there. I remember the high school principal when I told him I was leaving school that I was going in the army and he said you should try to get a deferment and finish high school. And I said, no way, I've been trying to get in the service for a year, and I'm going. <laughs> okay, do you remember what, what month and year that was? That would have been probably September of 1943. They took us down and put us on a train at the New York Central Station. We went into New York City. Uh, they gave us a meal at the Automat. I'd never been in New York City before. It was a big thrill. Then they, they put us on a subway, took us over to the Pennsylvania station, mm -hmm. and then they put us on a Long Island Express that goes out Long Island to Camp Upton, which was an induction center. Yeah. And that is where they gave you a lot of testing and classified you and assigned you to an outfit. Uh, I think I was there five days total getting tested and classified. And then we got on a train in New York City and it took us, oh, probably the best part of three days to get to Camp Crowder, Missouri at a troop train, which was not a sleeper, it was strictly a coach, but we were all young guys. Oldest guy in the outfit at that time was 30, and everybody called him Pop. And uh, anyway, we got there, we were all in good shape because we could sleep sitting up, it didn't bother us at all. And I remember rolling into uh, Camp Crowder, which was the main base for the signal corps. And we didn't, any of us know what we were supposed to be. So we all figured, oh, we're gonna be signal corps. And we went past these beautiful white barracks. And we said, boy, this looks pretty nice. And they kept on rolling right past. And we ended up at a bunch of tar paper, one story shacks that <laughs> weren't too, too fancy at all. And we were met by a bunch of non-coms and commission officers who were to be the start of the 253rd Combat Engineers. And when they told us what we were, we were all very surprised because we didn't expect that. <laughs> but we, uh, we uh, were not concerned about it. We didn't care one way or the other. And uh, the next day, we uh, met all of our cadre, the, the, uh, the cadre, the, all the non-commissioned officers were from the 5th Infantry Division, which had been stationed in Iceland. And just before the company, that division left Iceland, they sent these guys to the States to set up our outfit. All of our commissioned officers were, except the captain, uh, we're not, we're 90 day wonders, as we used to call them. Mm -hmm. They got their commission in 90 days. Mm -hmm. And uh, the regular army guys that we had as non-coms didn't have very high opinion of <laughs> the officers because they were as green as we guys were. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, the sergeants really trained everybody, the officers and the enlisted men. The, First days at Camp Crowder, of course, were mainly uh, involved in close order drill and uh, classroom work, learning military uh, ethics, like saluting officers, the reason why you salute officers, 
and et cetera, and et cetera. And uh, there was classroom work, and there was also work out in the outside doing, besides close order drill, we had to do a lot of uh, field work. They started teaching us how to dig foxholes, how to, uh, the rudiments of build, building bridges, uh, barbed wire entanglements, all kinds of things. Eventually we got into minefields, demolition, all kinds of things. Uh, in my very early days in BASIC, uh, I qualified very highly with a 30 caliber machine gun and unfortunately that meant I got to carry that heavy machine gun receiver on 10 mile and 20 mile hikes. So I made up my mind the first opportunity I was going to try and get a different job in my squad. So we took demolition and my math was pretty good and I was able to figure out what the charges should be and uh, the officers decided how would you like to be the demolition man for your platoon and I said that sounds great because all I had to do was carry a satchel of TNT and some caps over on the other side which were the things that detonated the TNT and it was a much lighter load so I was happy with that. <laughs> we, uh, we left uh, Crowder after basic, which was basically three months. After qualifying with the M1 rifle, uh, you got a furlough to go home for 10 days. Well, with travel time out of it, it took at least a day and a half each way. Trains were fast back then. They weren't slow. It took 26 hours to go from Camp Crowder to St. Louis, St. Louis to Cincinnati, Cincinnati to Cleveland, Cleveland to Buffalo. They did all that in 26 hours. We left there in uh, February of 1944, and we were sent to Tennessee for the Tennessee maneuvers, which were going on. Right. There were tank outfits, infantry outfits, everything you could think of as regular army, full army. Uh, battles going on, the Red Army versus the Blue Army. We have to be the Blue Army. And during maneuvers, I was killed at least once and wounded several times. You were. Once in a gas attack, <laughs> which was tear gas. And uh, the, I can remember we were going through the chow line and we were all wiping our eyes and we couldn't figure out what was going on. And uh, all of a sudden, these umpires came out and said, you guys are all either dead or wounded because you just had a gas attack. And it was tear gas that was bothering us. But we kept on eating the uh, chow, didn't bother us. It didn't, didn't make the chow any worse or better. So, by the way, maneuvers took place Monday through Friday. And Saturdays and Sundays, we had off and we were bivouacked in uh, pastures, actually farmers' fields, and uh, we, we had pup tents set up. We slept in those, which was really nice because during the week we slept on the ground with no tents, and uh, very often in our, in our foxholes. And that winter it did snow in Tennessee, so it was uh, quite, a, quite an experience. We went through uh, a bunch of uh, different uh, battles in different places of Tennessee, and we were never allowed to go into Nashville on the weekend because we had to be back by midnight on Sunday, and they were pretty sure we'd never make it back. Yeah. So we always ended up, our little leaves would be in these small southern towns where we had we had a good time we were treated well yeah. and then when we went through maneuvers and it was all over the infantry outfits and the tank outfits and probably most of the signal corps and certainly the quartermaster people went home but the engineer outfits knew how to build things 
we were kept in Tennessee to go around and repair damage that was done to fences, roads, uh, bridges by military vehicles. And uh, when we came to a farmer's home and we told them we were there to repair damage, boy, they were happy. And they treated us like kings. They, they give us fried chicken and all kinds of things. That, uh, and they were poor. They didn't have much to give, but they gave. So we had a lot of respect for those people. And of course, most of their young men were in the service, and a lot of them overseas. So it was, they appreciated it. So anyway, maneuvers ended, and we finally got through fixing up things after about a month, and then we went to what was Fort Campbell back in 1944. And uh, there we had a, we had a, I think it was the 10th Armored Division was also there. And uh, we were there with a bunch of other outfits. And we took more advanced training. That took in much more infantry training combat courses, uh, using live ammunition on what they call combat courses where you took uh, and ran this course and targets would pop up and you'd have to shoot the targets. And if you hit it, it would fall down and the umpires would score your outfit on how many hits you got. It turned out that one of the guys in our company was acting as scout, so he was up, oh, hundreds of feet ahead of the rest of us, and he jumped up to rush forward before he flapped down. One of the guys took a shot and hit him, and that was our first casualty. He uh, took a bullet in the back that went through his liver and his lung and out his right shoulder, and uh, he died on his way to the hospital. So that was uh, a sad episode. But after taking a lot of uh, advanced training in, particularly things like demolition and booby trapping and removing mines and putting mines in. But removing mines was trickier because very often they're booby trapped and you have to learn how to get under the mine and feel for things that shouldn't be there. So we, we spent uh, several months there and in September, we were told to get ready to ship overseas. So in October, we cleaned up the area. Of course, you always had to clean up your barracks and your kitchens and everything and leave them spotless before they put us on a troop train. This time it was a, a real troop train that had five-tier bunks, which were probably, oh well, golly, they couldn't have been more than 15 inches apart, your nose practically touching the bunk of the one above you. And they were five high, and, but it was a comfortable train. And being young, things didn't bother us. We enjoyed it. The food was not bad. And we ended up, I think it took us, oh, two and a half, three days to get up to the Boston area. And it seems to me we were in Camp Kilmer, waiting at support of embarkation. Uh, Boston, and uh, we spent several days there, and late October, I think it was, we got on the USS West Point, which was in peacetime called the America, and it was our most luxurious liner. And there were at least 10,000 of us on that ship, and it was able to do 30 knots which is faster by far than a German submarine could do underwater or on top. And so they sent us to Europe without a convoy, but we went through the South Atlantic and took a circuitous route down up the coast of Africa and back up past uh, Portugal and finally to uh, Liverpool in England. Then we were sent to a camp, which was up near York someplace, I can't even remember the town, 
And we were probably there, oh, a month. And again, we took more training, particularly in planting mines, removing mines, that kind of thing. And we had British uh, non-coms teaching us, guys who had been in North Africa and other places and were combat-wise, and it was really good training. Finally, in November, they said, we're shipping you to France because the Battle of the Bulge was going on and they needed troops badly, particularly troops to fill in as infantry. And we were trained to do that. So by the end of November, we had everything taken care of that we had to do. And late December, they took us over to Southampton, where we spent just a few days. And as it turned out, it was Christmas Eve, 1944, when they put us on a bunch of smaller ships to take us across the channel to Cherbourg. And uh, I think the ship I was on didn't hold more than a couple hundred guys at most, very most. And uh, it was a smooth voyage over. There was nothing happened uh, to us. And there was submarines, of course, were a concern. And we landed at Cherbourg. And uh, once we got to Cherbourg, we found out that one of the ships behind us had been torpedoed. It was a larger ship, and they lost about 800 troops on that one. So we had a close call. We never knew it. None of them were our guys. They were infantry. At Cherbourg, we spent a couple of days. Uh, they bivouacked us in a French chateau at Cherbourg. And uh, we spent our time mostly doing a little bit of training and uh, guarding German prisoners who they had working on local roads. There were very few civilians around because most of the houses had been destroyed during the invasion. There's a scene where the guys are uh, look like they're doing laundry or right. dishes or something. That was at that chateau. And uh, enlisted men stayed in, in what would have been the stables, but they were clean. And the officers stayed in the chateau. We, we spent probably a week or so there. And then they said, okay, pack a full field pack and take three days supplies of K rations and uh, usual field full pack. And we took us over to a railroad station between St. Lowe and uh, Cherbourg and put us on 40 and eights. And they must have had the best part of a full platoon on each one of those. I think they did take about 40 guys pretty close. And uh, we got on there, and there was a pot belly stove right in the middle of the thing. It had a, a pipe that went up through the roof, straight up through the roof, and there was wood piled around. And uh, of course, we lined up along the walls, dropped our packs, and claimed a place to sleep. Well, a lot of the guys thought they were being smart, and they put their packs down right by the door because they thought, oh, we'd be able to see things. Well, they could. They could see quite well, and they were pretty close to the stove. But at night, when we were traveling, the guys would have to go to the bathroom, and they'd get up, and everybody was sleeping all over the floor. And they'd have to walk, and they'd step on these guys, and they'd all wake up and start cursing them, and everybody would start laughing. There was a lot of profanity. <laughs> the Army is the Army. <laughs> the, uh, in the daytime, uh, we'd have the door cracked open most of the time because we wanted to see. And we were used to the cold. And uh, some of the guys, we'd, we'd stop every so often, about every two, three hours, they'd stop the train, and the guys would get off. and. Uh, a couple of the guys would get up on the platform on the back end of the, the boxcar 
because they could stand outside there and, as we were moving. Well, they found out that when their train was moving, it was colder than hell out there. <laughs> and, uh, they were, after the train stopped, they'd come back inside and <laughs> they were so cold. <laughs> the worst part of the trip actually was your bodily functions didn't want to work the way they should because your bowel movements, your kidney functions. Guys would get, jump off the train when it stopped and try to go have a bowel movement. It sure as devil, every time the train stopped, it would, st it would start up as soon as these guys started to do it. They'd have to pull up their pants and run to get back on the train. Yeah. And uh, so after four days, we got to a place called Lunaville in France, which was the end of the railroad for us. And uh, we had survived on corned beef, canned corned beef and bread for four days, three days, three meals a day. That's all we had. So we were very discouraged about the food. We didn't want to look corned beef in the eye for a long time after that. I still don't. <laughs> so anyway, we got to Lunaville. We spent a night in some big tents that they had put up around there. The next day they put us on some trucks and started moving us up closer to the front. And uh, we spent the next night in, a, in some tents. And we could hear in the distance artillery fire. We were still quite a ways from the front. The next day they put us on trucks and they took us into a small village, a farm village, at least our company. We were pretty well spread out as a battalion, but our company was in this small farm uh, village, which consisted of one big well in the center of the farm village. And all the little farmhouses were in a circle around this thing. It was the only supply of water for the whole place. And the cattle, they only would have four or five head of cattle was a big group, maybe two. And the cattle slept on one side of a wooden wall, on the other side was the house. And uh, we spent a couple of nights there. And then they took us up and introduced us to digging fox holes up near the Sar River. We were overlooking the Sar and in the film, it shows, it doesn't show us digging the foxholes, but it does show us as we're approaching the Sar at one point. And anyway, while we're there, we, we were filling in for troops that were Patton's troops, which had been swung north to eliminate the bulge. And so 7th Army, which we were in, had to spread out and occupy areas which had previously been 3rd Army area. Well, this meant 7th Army was very thin. So we were dug in. That was one of our big jobs was to dig foxholes, not only for ourselves, but in depth, even behind. Uh, dig deep ones and provide each one with a log roof over which you put dirt and then you put branches on top of that. That way, if you had tree bursts, which were very dangerous when uh, enemy fire would hit a tree, it would explode and the shrapnel would spread out all over. If you had a fox hole with a roof on it, you were in pretty good shape. The infantry still had to dig fox holes, and there's two different kinds of fox holes. There's the kind you dig quickly just to get most of your body below ground. And then there's the type that we were digging to get your whole body underground and also protect yourself from tree bursts. And you didn't have time to do that unless you were going to be right. in place for a week or more. And of course, the 7th Army was told they could not attack. They had to strictly stay in defense while the battle of you know, the bulge was continuing to the north. So the, uh, 
the position there was just one of stagnation. The Germans were on one side of the Saar River and we were on the other side. And there would be artillery going back and forth. And it, when we first got there, it all sounded the same to us. Going, what they called incoming mail would be German and outgoing mail was American. Well, right. most of it we learned was outgoing. The Germans didn't have that much. But we did learn to tell when it was incoming, too. It did have a different sound. And uh, unfortunately, the German 88 didn't make much sound because it wasn't a howitzer. It was really meant to be an anti-aircraft anti gun. And uh, 88s pretty much came in. You, you just heard a whistle and boom. And so it was, it was different. But uh, the Germans were happy that we didn't attack, and we were happy that they didn't attack. And uh, we really, outside of, uh, I remember being out with our platoon, and we were putting up a du double apron fence. And while we were doing this, a German Focke-Wolf fighter came down and started strafing. Well, he didn't hit anybody. Everybody dove, and uh, luckily, and I think he was, he was just making, maybe he was just testing his guns, I don't know. But anyway, he came down and he strafed and he went back up, and immediately our radio operators notified headquarters, and headquarters told the Air Force, and within 20 minutes to a half hour, we had a whole flight of uh, Thunderbirds. While we were doing this, they moved us around quite a bit to do these uh, entrenchments. And we kept meeting different troops, like the 44th Division, the 45th Division, the 100th Division. Even some guys from the 101st Airborne were wandering around. And uh, the, third, the 3rd Infantry, we didn't see too much of because they were more south of us, and that's where Audie Murphy was when he won his Congressional Medal of Honor. It was probably 30 miles south of where we were. And uh, anyway, we got to see a lot of different troops, and uh, we met guys that had served under George Patton. We stayed in that position until March, and in March, they pulled us back again and said, we want you to practice some bridge building. So we knew something was going to take place in March because the bulge was pretty much gone now. Well, the bridges they wanted us to build were not the big Bailey bridges, which uh, were strong enough to support the heaviest equipment like a Sherman tank or the biggest trucks. What we were building were more to transport Jeeps and two and a half tons, six by sixes uh, across for infantry. So we took uh, probably a week and a half to two weeks doing that. And then about March 10th or so, they moved us back up into this village and said, uh, pack your full field packs and be ready to leave at a moment's notice. Well, on March 14th, they moved us up to the town of Sargamines, which is right on the Sar River. And on one side of that river, of course, was American. The other side was Germans who were heavily entrenched. And the 44th Division was, had been holding that position. But the attack through Sargamines was to be done by the uh, 63rd Infantry Division, and they were, their trucks were all lined up in town, and our were all lined up, and we were told to get out of our trucks and take shelter in the buildings in Sargamines, which we did. At about four o'clock in the morning, the attack started, the infantry, the Pathfinders for the infantry went across with assault boats. The river was probably 
uh, maybe 200 feet wide at the most, maybe less, that they went across in assault boats and up the other side and of course took heavy fire and it was heavily mined along the banks. And the worst thing was the, what they called shoe mines. The Germans had these little tiny wooden boxes in which they would put a half a pound of TNT and a cap and it was set up in such a way it was hinged. If somebody stepped down, it was covered with dirt. If you stepped down on it, it would push down, activate the cap and set the thing off, which would blow the bottom of your leg off. And uh, of course, that's as good as killing a guy. So there were a lot of guys that suffered there. And of course, somebody, Ardolf, thank goodness, didn't have to go over there. And engineers usually did this probe for the shoe mines. But they finally got the 63rd across. And then they pushed the Germans back, oh, probably 100 yards, 200 yards. And we were told to start building the bridge, which we did. And as soon as we started building the bridge, the Germans tried shelling. But their shelling was left a lot to be desired because it didn't do much except make a lot of noise. There was a lot of it just falling in the river, not doing any real harm. So the bridge got built, and as soon as it was built, all of the 63rd came rumbling across in their jeeps and trucks and over to the other side. And I would say by the end of the day, they had pushed the Germans at least a half mile away, maybe farther. But the next day, we heard that the Germans were counterattacking, and the and it turned out to be true because pretty soon here comes the 63rd Division, which was not uh, a very experienced division in combat. Anyway, they were coming, pulling back and digging in on the other side of the river, and their heavy equipment guys and heavy machine guns and that came over in the area where we were and started setting up in the upper stories so they could survey the, the area. And that night there was a lot of fighting going on and my job being a demolition expert was to stay by our bridge, which I had helped uh, place charges on so that if there was a counterattack, we could explode the charges and do away with the bridge so the Germans couldn't cross it. My job, along with uh, one of my buddies, was to set in the foxhole, which we had dug right near the bridge, probably within 100 feet or so. And I had the detonator in my hand, and if they had started across the bridge, the Germans, why, my job was upon orders to detonate it. Well, we sat there, and I remember that night laying there and watching the tracer bullets going back and forth. And uh, of course we were perfectly safe because we were well below the ground and we never stuck our head up. We weren't about to try and shoot our rifle. We wouldn't have done any good anyway because you couldn't see anybody. And uh, the next, by the end of the night, things quieted down and the next day it turned out that the 63rd had pushed the Germans back again. And from that point on, it was kind of a foot race, actually, because we and the infantry, in many cases, were in trucks trying to keep up with the Germans who were retreating so fast towards the Rhine. There's also a scene in the movie where uh, they're in a convoy. Yes. And there's a woman in the truck ahead of them. Yes. And he's shooting a picture of her. I think that this person was a displaced person, that one of the trucks came across and she wanted to get, of course we were, I think this took place when we were moving up towards the Rhine and she wanted to go east. So I think, I wasn't in that truck, but I think somebody was 
nice enough to say, get in the truck. Yeah. And they, they took her. I'm not sure about that, but that's what I think it was because she looked like a displaced person. A displaced person was a person who the Germans took out of either Russia or Yugoslavia or Poland or any of the countries that they occupied during the war and sent them back to Germany as slave labor. And uh, most of them uh, was pitiful because they had no family, they had lost all touch with their country, they, they didn't know what was going on. Now many of those people were Polish and some of them were Russian and some of them after the war they did all our KP duty for us. And of course they loved it because they got to eat well. Displaced persons, particularly if they were from Russia or from Poland and had been subjected to any of the Russian rule, a lot of them did not want to go back because it turned out that Stalin was as bad as Hitler. He was just as evil and did just as many bad things. So, uh, it was understandable. So a lot of them stayed in Germany as long as they could and uh, some of them I think had relatives in the States and maybe eventually they got to go back home. Most of those people were not Jewish because most of the Jewish people were put into concentration camps and systematically uh, eliminated where the normal citizen, a Polish person or uh, Yugoslav or whatever they might be were used as slave labor. We're still in March of 1945. Okay. So we followed our infantry divisions, which most of the time was the, turned out to be the 45th division. And we finally, after several days going across, we went through, well, on the way we went through all kinds of German villages. As you went through, you would notice that there were bed sheets, white bed sheets hanging out of the windows or hanging from big flagpoles. And that was a sig to signify that this village was not going to fight, that there were no troops there to resist us because the uh, American infantry would go into the villages under a white flag and meet with the Burgermeisters and say, if there's a fight, we're going to demolish your village with artillery. So talk the German troops into leaving. And in most cases, they did. So a lot of the villages we went through, we, we wondered, what are all these white sheets? And uh, that's what it was. It was a, a token of you know, no resistance. And it took several days, uh, probably, oh golly, that's part of a week or more, and we got across, we got to the Rhine River at Vorms, and there was no fighting going on there at the time. Third Infantry Division had crossed about the same time that the 45th did, and they ran into uh, a panzer outfit one of these SS Panzer outfits, and they took extremely heavy losses crossing the Rhine, where the 45th Division met only very light resistance going across. So we didn't see any action at our outfit at that point. We just crossed the bridge like a, <laughs> like a Sunday afternoon drive. And from that point on, after we crossed the Rhine, we just took <laughs> got in our trucks and drove as far as we could drive almost in one day and uh, if there were any Germans along the way who wanted to surrender you accepted their surrender and most of them by that time the smart ones surrendered the most at that point in time we're now getting into April and the Germans uh, knew they were defeated but the Hitler Youth the ones that volunteered, these guys, kids were 15, 16, 17 years old, were tough. They would fight to the death. And 
that was exactly what happened to a lot of their teenagers. They were, they were brainwashed and they didn't have enough sense to quit. And they died. We got down as far as uh, Augsburg, which is close to Munich, and we stopped there. And while we were there, the war came to an end. In fact, is when Roosevelt died, I remember we didn't know it when President Roosevelt died. The first one to tell me that the president was dead was a German civilian, and I couldn't figure out. Is he telling the truth? I didn't know whether to believe him or not, but of course it turned out he was absolutely correct. And then shortly after his death, it wasn't long before Victory Day in Europe was announced and the war was over. So from that point on, we moved around to different places almost immediately after the war we were split up. We still had the outfit. It was still the 253rd Combat Engineers, but the outfit was split up into small units, platoons, uh, squads, even even less than squads, that we were sent to various places. I remember our platoon going to a, an industrial town up near Castle or someplace almost in the British zone and inventorying uh, underground uh, electronic storage area. They had all kinds of material, their radio equipment, and it was bomb proof. It was so far underground that uh, it never got touched. And then we were, we were assigned to a lot of different places around Germany. Uh, myself and three other guys were assigned to a IG Farben factory which made, uh, I think it would have been asphalt that they made in that plant. It was damaged, but it was still producing. So the three of us were put in this plant all by ourselves. This was probably oh, less than a month after the war ended. And now, where would this have been? Uh, Ludwig Schaffen, which is Ludwig across from Mannheim. We were put there on our own. We had a corporal, Corporal Smart, I can't think of his first name, but he was in charge. I was a PFC and so were the other two guys. And we'd been together all the while. We were in the Army just about, almost. So we were supposed to keep track of uh, production at this place. And of course, we didn't have any idea what was going on in that plant. And whatever they told us they produced, that's what we put in the ledgers. <laughs> we sat in a big office right by the gates, and all the trucks that came in and out had to come in and tell us what their business was there. And if they were taking stuff out, they had to tell us what was on the truck and how much of it. Well, we just, we just entered whatever they told us. And we were staying in an office building at the time, on the second floor. There was nothing on the second floor of this office building except empty offices, except for this room that we had. And we had a private uh, bathroom up there, and uh, we had three cots, a couple of big desks, a couple of tables and chairs. In this office building were a lot of attractive young ladies. And of course, I was 19 at the time, I think, Corporal Smart might have been 21, and Jim Bailey was probably 21, maybe. He was our company medic, by the way, and uh, during the war. Anyway, we, uh, we weren't supposed to fraternize uh, with the Germans. In other words, we weren't supposed to get friendly with any Germans. That was prohibited. and. Uh, of course, it was a ridiculous rule because there was no way that the GIs weren't going to fraternize because Americans happened to be friendly people anyway. And uh, pretty girls to a soldier are uh, 
like cheese to a mouse. <laughs> it didn't take long before we were, I became very good friends with the chief engineer at the plant. He'd come down, and he spoke English like, a, like an Englishman. He was highly educated, a PhD in engineering. And he, would, he would bring me uh, books that were written in English, his own books. And he found out that I liked math and I liked puzzles, and he started giving me all these math books and puzzles, and we just had a good time together. But anyway, getting back to the girls, uh, there was also another office on, in the plant where the girls were closer to the actual production. And this was a smaller office, there probably were only 10, 15 young ladies in this office. And my friend Jim Mealy used to disappear every day. And I couldn't figure out, where does he go every day? So I asked him. He said, oh, I go over there and shoot the bull with these girls. So I went over with him and uh, got friendly with the girl there. And uh, we became very good friends. And uh, one thing led to another. It was, it was a fun assignment. We were sorry after being there for maybe three, four weeks that we were told that, you know, that, that assignment was over. We were going back to the company. So that was sad news. <laughs> we went back to the company and they moved us around a lot. One of the most exciting things that happened to me while I was over there was being appointed to serve as a, on guard duty at the press conference of Hermit Goering, uh, which was right after the war ended. Uh, by the way, a few days before that, we had actually seen, some of us had, I had seen the cow concentration camp, which was uh, a horrible thing. The assignment uh, to uh, be on guard duty to see Herman Gehring. Well, we had no idea who was going to be at the press interview. All we knew is that somebody important was going to be there and they need a lot of guards all over the area. Well, it turned out that my buddy, I'm pretty sure it was Sam Bellina, and myself were posted right at the front gate of this little cottage it had a white picket fence around it and a stone walk leading up to the cottage. And that was the entrance. Well, this big limousine pulled up and a bunch of American officers got out. There were bird colonels. And uh, out steps this guy with a powder blue uniform. It turned out to be Herman Gehring. He didn't have his medals on but you could see where he'd had a lot of medals. And he had a big grin on his face, and he felt very important, you could tell. And uh, he went inside, and of course we didn't see him inside, and uh, had the press interview. And when he came out, he was still smiling, got back in the car, and he left. And we heard afterwards that when Eisenhower heard that he had been treated like some sort of royalty. He was furious, and he had Gary put into a prison cell immediately. And I think the uh, high brass that uh, were responsible for the uh, royalty treatment that he received probably got reprimanded for that by Eisenhower himself. One of the places that shows in the film quite prominently is the Kasern, which is German for barracks, I guess, at uh, Swetsingen. Mm -hmm. And that's prominently shown in the video. And we had very nice quarters there. We, uh, the whole company was there. In fact, there was even a company of uh, infantry sharing that big complex with us. And that's close to Heidelberg, which is a very nice city. It was not damaged that much during the war. In fact, is the farther south you went, the less damage 
there was in Germany. There was almost none in Bavaria. Heidelberg was a very nice town to go have leave in, and uh, we spent over a month there, I'm pretty sure. There was a lot to do there. We had, on, on the, uh, the property, we had our own private club, which we called the Under 85ers Club. And 85 was a number of points that you had to have at the end of the war to go home immediately. And points were awarded on the basis of sp time spent in the Army, in the States, overseas, also number of medals that you got, the number of battle stars, etc. So we were guys that didn't have 85 points. We hadn't been. We'd only been in Europe during the war for seven months, probably. That's all we saw. So we didn't get to go home for the best part of the year before we left. The, uh, anyway, we uh, spent a lot of time at uh, Swetsingen, and then we were moved farther south. We, we went to uh, Alm. We spent quite a bit of time at Alm which is on the so-called Blue Danube, which is muddy. And uh, we, I played, more than anything else, I played baseball there, I think. I, I did some guard duty. Uh, we'd go to our, down the, we were in a suburb of all, we weren't out, we were kind of on the outskirts. We weren't right downtown or anything. And we had our own private, uh, Gin mill. By this time, <clears throat> they had done away with the silly policy of non-fraternization, which nobody paid attention to, right. including the officers. And there were always plenty of girls at the gin mill. And there was a band there every night with three German musicians who played danceable music and uh, not bad music at all. And so we had a good time. We had lots of wine and beer to drink. It was very little hard liquor for the enlisted men because the officers got a liquor reaction. Well, enlisted men didn't. But uh, wine and beer will do the job if you put your mind to it. The Eagle's Nest, of course, this is where Hitler and Eva Braun spent a lot of their uh, leisure time. We uh, got to go there after the war. It was shortly after the war. They started running what I would call military bus tours to this eagle's nest. And a group of us, probably about 10 guys from my company, took this bus, went up there. And uh, they had some staff, German staff there. There was still, at this point, it was high enough up, there was still snow on the slopes. And they said, would you like to try skiing? Well, I'd never skied in my life, so we tried to ski. We put the skis on, and the next thing I knew, I was going down the hill backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have the foggiest idea how to control it, so all I could do was fall down. They came over, got me back on my feet, got me turned around, and put me on a little bunny slope. And I did a couple of little maneuvers down the slope, but uh, really didn't learn how to ski, but I had a good time falling around in the snow, and we all got a bunch of laughs out of it. And we went inside the eagle's nest and toured it. It was quite impressive. Didn't seem to have damage to it at that point. Went out on the famous balcony and overlooked the beautiful scenery. And uh, I got to thinking as I stood there, you know, here stood one of the most evil guys that ever lived in the history of the world. And, you know, what a waste of scenery. They have something that beautiful and somebody that evil, you know, who occupied that balcony. And it almost spoiled the trip just thinking about it. During the, the war, I had uh, five days leave to go to uh, Lake Geneva in France. And uh, we went there by truck. 
this would probably have been, I've got to guess, February back then. And the climate wasn't bad. It was quite warm at Lake Geneva, even in February. It wasn't, wasn't bad. And uh, we spent three days there. And uh, being dumb teenagers, we thought all French people liked uh, Charles de Gaulle. Well, we were quite naive because a lot of French people had no use for Charles de Gaulle. And this particular part of France was uh, actually more pro-labor, pro-communist area. And de Gaulle, of course, was not their cup of tea at all. So if you wanted to get in bad with the locals, all you had to do was say something nice about General de Gaulle, and they'd almost spit on the sidewalk. So <laughs> we quickly learned not to do that. We went to uh, nightclubs, GI nightclubs they were set up for us, and it was a good relaxing for about three days, and then we had to get back on the train and go back to the company, back to war. But the uh, best furlough I had was Probably, this would have been April, might have been May, I can't remember anymore, of uh, 1945. My buddy Leo Criaturo and myself got a seven-day furlough to go to the Riviera, and we took a train out of Munich. Well, we got on the train at night. Things were still pretty in rough shape around the train station, bombed out. It was pitch dark. We got on this train anyway. We were all by ourselves in this, in this car, and we thought, well, this is good. So there were no lights in the car. There was no heat. We figured, well, once the train gets moving, we'll get heat and we'll get lights. Well, the train started moving, and an hour later, we were freezing. It turned out the car that we had gotten into had no windows whatsoever, <laughs> and it was cold. And uh, the, uh, there was no lights, there was no heat. And it took uh, maybe a couple hours before the train came to a stop, and Leo and I quickly jumped off the train and ran up towards the engine. We figured the closer to the engine, the more heat there has to be. So we didn't care if we had to shovel coal. <laughs> but uh, we got up there, and the only thing that had any heat at all was a second-class uh, car that was full of civilians. And they were, of course, French civilians, and we couldn't speak French. They couldn't speak English, or if they could, they wouldn't. Anyway, we got on. and. Uh, sat on the hard wooden seats that they had, and boy, we were glad to sit on those hard wooden seats because <laughs> they had lights and they had heat. And we, uh, we had a good enough time with the people smiling and making hand gestures and trying to communicate, but uh, we finally got to a point far enough south when you go through these mountains that separate the Riviera from the rest of France, why like it suddenly turns quite warm, and just about the time it started to get light, we entered the Riviera area, and it wasn't too long, we began to see palm trees, and pretty soon we were in Nice, and uh, we went to the, uh, we showed our passes to the MPs and reported into the bivouac people, and they assigned us to a, a hotel right on the, right on the waterfront close to the uh, UFO, and uh, the, uh, what, we, what we did in, in, the, in the hotel was just sleep. We didn't spend any time in there. And I think it was probably the first time I'd ever seen a bidet, and I think it was Leo's first time. And uh, I think the only use it ever got while we were there was we threw up in it <laughs> after drinking too much. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we, we uh, went to the uh, GI's service club and 
for just a few francs you could get five-star Hennessy cognac and we used to finish a bottle every night. <laughs> By the fall, we knew we were about to go home and so they, they notified those of us who had the necessary points to get ready to go home to let the folks back home know that you'd be there soon and get your stuff packed and so we uh, got ready. So anyway, we made preparation to ship out, which was a very happy thing for us. We were all given, uh, almost everybody I think, was given an opportunity to enlist for another year and get a promotion to become sergeant or something like that, but most of us didn't want to do that because most of our friends were going to be leaving and we'd had enough of the Army by now. Yeah. We wanted to get back home, so we did. And the train going back was a regular passenger train and uh, it went through Paris. We, we spent some time in Paris on the way back to Cherbourg. And uh, we got back to Cherbourg and uh, boarded the ship which turned out to be the USS George Washington, which was probably commissioned about 1903, back when Teddy Roosevelt was president. But it was a pretty decent uh, ship. It was still used as a luxury liner back then, and uh, it wasn't as new as the West Point had been. But we didn't care. The, uh, it was fun. The, uh, the thing that we noticed going out of France that was different going into France was the attitude of the French people. Going in, they were happy to see us. They were tossing flowers, fruit, and stuff to us while we were traveling in our 40 and 8s. On the way out, they didn't look happy because uh, now we've been over there and of course there were all those American troops in France and I think it was kind of <laughs> like an army of occupation to them. And, you know, there was always uh, a little friction between troops and, and the French. So I think it was natural. I think if we had troops in our country that occupied us for a year, we'd probably be a little nervous about it too. So one of the most interesting things to me about the video itself is the fact that there even was a video because I don't recall people even having Kodak cameras, <laughs> you know, or anything, let alone a movie camera. And the thing that somebody in Company A and probably somebody right in my platoon because so many of the guys are guys that were in my platoon had a movie camera really surprises me. The thing, of course, is there were no pictures taken up at the front lines with any combat business going on, and you wouldn't expect it because <laughs> you wouldn't be taking pictures at a time like that. But it's, it's really interesting to see all of these guys, and the, and the quality of the film surprises me because it's 60 it's over 60 years old, that film, and so I'm surprised. I'm pretty sure that John Stoll did it, or if it wasn't John Stoll, I can't think of the name of one of the other guys that's in the film a lot. Uh, might have been the camera person. But how in the world do you ever carry that around? Because, as you say, you didn't have a lot of room. Of course, when you were when you were out on assignment up front, you weren't, you weren't going to have your duffel bag. You were, all you're going to have is a backpack. Right. You know, and that's probably why you never took pictures of, of any kind, you know, digging those holes and things. Right. It, uh, but it did take a lot. In, in fact, the other thing that surprised me was Hopkinsville, because I never went to Hopkinsville, Kentucky. I always went to uh, Nashville in Tennessee. In the Grand Ole Apry, which was... Well, the ones in, that are shown in Hopkinsville are pretty much the cadre, aren't they? They're all sergeants and uh, except, corporals and stuff. Except Chad Stoll. 
and, and, and one of his buddies. They were privates. Yeah. But most of the guys went to Nashville. Some guys did go to uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky. Yeah. There was a church up there that a lot of the guys went to. And they had dances on weekends and the young ladies that came and hung out with the guys there while they were at the dance. But most of us went to Nashville because that was the big city. And uh, the Grand Old Abbey was there. Did you discover some people from what we've done that were still around or that you didn't know about or anything like yes, that? Yes, yes. Some of the names that you sent me, like Crosley in Rochester, I didn't know he was around. I didn't even know that uh, Al Cleesaddle lived in uh, Niagara Falls, New York. Right close to you. Yes. So when I go back, I got to call him up and see what he knows, if he knows of anybody that's still around. There were several guys from Rochester, like uh, our uh, squad leader, Stanley uh, Snyder, and uh, yeah. I'd like to go online and, and also check out the Rochester phone book to see if there's probably a lot of Stanley Snyders, but uh, yeah. see if I could track him down. He, he'd be a year or two older than I am, so he could easily be well. But he was a prince of a guy. Yeah. There were a lot of, lot of faces there I recognized. I couldn't put names with. It helped when I, I went through that Christmas roster that I had saved. And sometimes by seeing the name, it would recall the face. But it's, it's hard to recall the you know, that many names after all these years. There's a guy early on in the film yeah. over at uh, Camp Crowder. Right. Shortly after we were issued our M1 rifles, and there are two or three guys out there, and they're horsing around yeah. with the rifle, doing, you know, shoulder arms and down and all that. And I can't identify any of those guys. And I, they look so familiar. I know I know them, but I cannot get that name. Oh, that would be particularly, great to find Particularly them. the one guy. He was always horsing around. And uh, I, I think sooner or later I'll come up with his name. There were a couple of guys that that had, they were real funny guys, like Tony Labraca was always funny, but I don't think it was he because uh, I think he was taller than any of those guys, but I can't, I just can't get the name of yeah. those guys that I figured. Well, well, whoever took that film should know. It's too bad we can't find the, oh, yeah. the filmmaker. Boy, they could tell you a lot. When we went down to get on the train, John Stoll was there, and his wife was there. And I met his wife. And his wife also came to... Uh, Fort Campbell for a short time to, to visit. And there's, John Stoll and I had a three-day pass in London. And I remember we were billeted at a private home. And he had, John Stoll had relatives, or his wife, I guess it was his wife's relatives that he went to see. I'm almost sure that John would be the filmmaker. John Stoll was big in every direction. He was yeah. tall, he was husky, and uh, strong as a bull. There's, in fact, in that cocktail, uh, you know, champagne drinking part of the film, yeah. John is sitting on a windowsill without his helmet on, and he's got a glass of champagne and he's kind of toasting with it. And that, that was most of the time when you saw John, he had a helmet on. Yeah. But he, uh, I've got a feeling he might be passed. When they formed the outfit, there wasn't anybody younger than I was. Right. I was really a, a young 18, wet behind the ears. <laughs> oh, geez. Really dumb. Did somebody, did, did any of them take you kind of under their wing when because of your age? Or? Oh, they, they tried to take advantage at times, some guys, but most, most, most of the guys were really good guys, you know, they, but uh, 
they take you to town. They, you know, they, the married guys were, were used to sex, and uh, they, uh, they really look forward to going to town and finding, <laughs> finding sex. And I didn't have any interest in it at all. I was so frightened after seeing all these films, what we called the Mickey Mouse films, <laughs> you know, about venereal diseases. And boy, some of, some of those ladies of the night were so ugly. Oh, God. <laughs> they were really bad. I wouldn't touch them on a 10-foot pole <laughs> or a 5-foot Czechoslovakia. It was really... But it, uh, I found a lot, of, a lot of pleasure in just <laughs> being with a, a girl, go to an ice cream parlor, go to a movie, hold hands. It was a funny thing because I went from being 18 to 20, something like that, you know? It, yeah, uh, yeah. It, I, well, uh, nothing would, would <laughs> age you and, and mature you quicker than a war. Yeah, and being being with guys in their 20s, and at that age, yeah. three, two, three years makes a big difference. Oh, yeah. At 21, you're a lot more mature than 18. Oh, yeah. College kids are a lot more mature than high school kids. Yeah. Yeah. And I was a high school kid.